So do you mean like Birkenstock type things? <laughs> yeah, that'll do. You'd be a modern lecturer if you had one of those. Yeah, I need the patches on my elbows though, don't and, I? And long toenails. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Sales TV. Uh, we were just uh, d- talking about being a lecturer, a modern lecturer in, in, in the modern world, although that did sound rather retro, didn't it? Um, so, uh, welcome, everybody, and today uh, we're talking about the things that uh, sales teams need to, need to know and do to be successful in 2023 and beyond. Um, so bef- before we do anything, should we all go around and introduce ourselves? A- Andy. Hi, I'm Andy Huff, a modern lecturer at Cranfield University um, and founder of the ISP. Tim. Hello, everybody. I'm Tim Hughes. I'm the CEO and co-founder of DLA Ignite, and I'm famous for writing the book, Social Selling Techniques to Influence Bias and Changemakers. Alex. I'm Alex Abbott, founder of Sapiro. We help individuals generate conversations at scale using social media. Now, I do want to say I am feeling uh, a two out of 10 today. So any uplifting messages in the comments are most welcome. And uh, I'm Adam Gray. I'm Tim's business partner and co-founder of DLA Ignite. Uh, And I'm actually feeling an eight or nine out of 10 today, but I feel an eight or nine out of 10 every day because I'm easily pleased, I think. (laughs) <laughs> uh, rather than anything else share some of that energy you have a uh, yeah, very low bar it's still coming your your way uh, so 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 this was this was your idea wasn't it alex that we should do five things that modern sales teams need to to know to be effective in in the modern world yeah yeah so last week i was sort of given the opportunity to lead uh, a round table discussion for the Institute of Sales Professionals. So a bunch of sales leaders can come along and we'll chat about stuff. Uh, But the topic was, interestingly, is your sales organization fit for the future? And um, and so I kind of posed four questions to the group in, uh, uh, you know, small segments of chat. Uh, the, The first question, Uh, was what are the most significant changes you see coming to the sales industry? Now, um, before I go through the other three, uh, I can share some of the highlights uh, Mm. of each discussion. Um, uh, But before before I do, I kind of set the scene for the sales leaders to say, look, you know, we're experiencing uh, unprecedented times, and that might be an overused term. You know, I kind of framed the conversation around three things that I see that are happening to us today within, within B2B sales. Number one is that buyer and seller misalignment. We've talked about that a lot. Uh, and the fact that, um, you know, buyer behavior has been changing for many years. But in the last few, it's been more significant. Uh, buyers simply do not want to speak to sellers anymore. Makes sellers' jobs very difficult to build relationships. Number two. So on, on that topic on you say misalignment what exactly do you mean when you say misalignment so um i mean if we go right back to uh the research that matt dixon and brent adamson did 15 years ago um when they were part of the cv they found that um back then 60 percent of the purchase decision was concluded by the time a buyer contacted a vendor or a seller and I think what we've seen over the last 15 years is that purchase decision get deeper into conclusion before a buyer reaches a seller. And there are many reasons for that. I think one of the biggest reasons is the fact that sellers, when they speak to buyers, they sell to them. And that's not a good experience for buyers. So they choose to spend as little time as possible with sellers when they're trying to uh, identify a problem that needs solving within the organization and explore the uh, uh, you know the solutions to to addressing it right yeah, yeah. so the second point sorry to interrupt <laughs> well and just just to add to that before I move on and that's created this systemic kind of uh, uh, you know depletion of trust and and now buyers will do anything they can to get advice from any anyone other than a salesperson. 
the the second point is um, the fact that the the workforce as a whole is getting younger, and uh, you know if we think about um, Gen Z and uh, uh, some research that was done by the World Economic uh, Forum, I believe Dr. Dale Childs uh, uh, brought that to my attention in a LinkedIn post that he'd done a few weeks ago. Um, that 27 percent of the workforce will be Gen Z within the next two years. And if we think about uh, millennials, bringing millennials into that, it's somewhere between 50 to 75 percent of the workforce will be Gen Z and millennials within the next two years. And that's, a, that's a terrifying thought, really, isn't it? It, it makes me feel very old. And um, but, but also it, it, it's a it's a. a a sort of paradigm shift isn't it in terms of who we consider as having uh influence in the workplace and this you know i guess as as more young people enter the workforce uh, they gradually work their way up and they become more influential and we as old people become uh less and less relevant yeah yeah i think i think the big the biggest thing that sort of came out of uh, of that discussion because uh, we talked about these things before we got into the roundtable discussion is that um, you know the younger generation uh, 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 you know wh wh whether you like it or not the, the research I read uh, says that they're a more entitled generation and they they, they uh, feel very strongly about their values and beliefs and if those values and beliefs don't align with the organization that they're working for or the businesses that they're selling to, um, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to tell them what to do and expect them to do it. Um, you know, things like cold calling and cold emailing. If, if an individual, an intelligent Gen Z knows that cold calling is the number one reason a buyer will not buy from a seller or a vendor, and that's according to Trust Radius's research. They they won't believe it's the right thing to do. They're, therefore, they won't they won't do it. And telling them to do something that they know is wrong um, affects their mental health. And eighty nine percent of Gen Zs in sales are already suffering burnout. And they're suffering burnout because they're doing tasks that they know are not productive and tasks they don't want to do and tasks that are soul destroying. So yeah. they're just kind of disengaging from the working experience, I assume. Yeah, make more calls, send more tailored emails that nobody reads anymore. It's that, it's that you know, do, do more uh, knowing it doesn't work and, and that's, that's having an effect on their, uh, their overall well-being. It's stressing them out. Because they're being told to do more with less support, yep, um, and that ends up resulting in affecting their, their mental health, right? Um, and we've got, you know, we've got research from the Sales Health Alliance. Jeff Risley uh, in 2022 found that 79% of sales reps are highly stressed. 63% of sales reps uh, have confirmed themselves, kind of self-reported that they're suffering with poor mental health. And 60% of sales leaders are suffering with poor mental health, up from 40% in 2021. So this isn't... That's, that's a very big shift, isn't it? You know, a 50% increase in the number of people that are reporting suffering from poor mental health in just two years. Well, it was one year, from 21 to 22. Right. And that's sales leadership. I think sales, you know, my, my view is sales leadership were kind of taking, taking the brunt protecting the team um, and as we've seen this massive shift in buyer behavior buyers not responding to marketing and sales messages the pressures fall felt uh, fallen firmly on sales leadership who can no longer protect their teams like they perhaps once did wow that's got us off to a really cheery start. <laughs> <laughs> so where, where are I'm we just, i'm just i'm yeah. just gonna go and hang myself all right <laughs> Is that is that so? Um, is that number? Are we on number two or number three? That was number oh, two. We're, so we're, we're on number two, but we've, we've still got more joy to come, Tim. We, more yeah. joy to come. 
we slid into number three, which is there's a mental health endemic. In okay. Yeah. 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 So, so, okay. So, so, so how, how do we put this right? You know, the, the, the we don't, we're all going to hell in a handbasket, right? The, the point was yeah, over. We, 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 here are some, some things that people need to do to be successful. Uh, we, we, we've now explain, explained why they need to do these things because they're not being successful and the impact is more than just not making the number. You know, their whole psyche is being impacted by the fact that they're doing things they hate and they're not getting the results they need. So so what can people start to do? What can sales teams start to do? Well, I, I can share some of the things that came out of the discussion. But oh, yeah. Brad, it, it looked like you were, you were you were poised, ready to add something. Who? Uh, you. If, I, no, I, no, I'm, st I'm, st I'm still trying to get to a point of positivity about all this. <laughs> okay. Okay. So here's, here's, here's the first couple of things that came out of the discussion, which uh, I, I feel like I need to get into bearded sales guy character to read these out because it's nothing new, unfortunately. Uh, but relationship building. So there was a discussion. <laughs> <You>. <laughs> yeah. There was, there was, and I know this is serious, so, you know, uh, uh, but I think... Um, and, and is that relationships with customers or, or within internally within the organisation? Well, Ooh, it was... Good, good, good question. Yeah. Um, it was actually more related to uh, the individual developing their personal brand, okay. their professional brand, uh, and to... Uh, uh, help me out here, Adam, uh, Yian. Yian, yeah. Yian's comment. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's about being authentic and genuine. So relationship building is about being authentic and genuine, whether it's internal or, or external, you know, not just laser focused on a, on a number and a number alone. <laughs> but I, I thought, I thought Andrew's point was quite a good. I, point, I, right? I, yes. So is this, because so, so there are a whole host of things going on here. Uh, people have been worn down by the time they've been doing these things they haven't liked. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, the pressure has increased because we're facing economic headwinds. Uh, the third thing is people are more aware of the state of their own mental health because, you know, we read about it often and people are being more cognizant of these things that are going on. And fourth, there's less stigma attached to it. I'm really struggling now is not something which will get you sacked or get you laughed at in the workplace, which it would have done when I started work a few years ago. Yeah. Probably still would in a sales organisation. Well, and, and maybe therein lies the crux. Hor sorry to lob that in on a semi-serious point, but uh, it's, it's down to addictive leadership again. You know, it's... Forever we've debated, not us, but we are debating it to a degree, is that salespeople don't need regulation. You don't need a license to practice. Yet, to, to your point, Alex, as a buyer, which we are four buyers on here and everyone listening is a buyer, we don't buy anything without a, an understanding of how that individual is regulated or how that company's previous customers have had an experience, i.e. a reference of rating. So things like, just to bring it down to humanity, check a trade. You know, you've got now that if you want a plumber or a builder or somebody, they are on check a trade and it's got a whole bunch of theoretical, um, genuine reviews. If you buy something from a customer, uh, so something from a website or something from certain companies, they're all there on Trustpilot or Bizarre Voice. You read your Amazon reviews of suppliers, etc., and eBay. You don't stay in an Airbnb without looking at the reviews and looking at the rating. You don't go, and, and it's it's the fact that we sit there and go, still don't still don't need to do it. It's all about the number, and yet every single one of us is biased on how we buy. And corporate salespeople, even B two C salespeople to a degree, have missed it by a country mile. Now it's not down for the individual to do it on their own, but they can. And it comes back, Alex, to your point about personal brand. Mm. Why would you want to deal with me 
why would you want a conversation with me? Your perception is it's all about the number and that's the one-sided conversation I'm going to have with you. But what if I was to say to you, actually, no, that's not the way I want to behave with you. I, I want to have a quite interesting conversation. I want to get to know you. I want to get to know your company. I'd really like to understand the nuances that happen in what you do that puts you in a unique position within your marketplace. And then how can I help that with what I do? And if I can't help it today, well, wouldn't it be great if I actually at least had an understanding of where I could help it potentially in the future and we just keep in contact and keep having those conversations? It, somebody said to me, by the time it comes down to customers asking for some kind of certification of qualification or branding of a salesperson, it's too late. We've missed the boat. And I think that is the point. And if organizations started to embrace that and care about their salespeople as individuals, care about the things that they ask them to do professionally and personally and not do stupid things, then, then we're going to have a place where they're going to think about sustainable actions and therefore salespeople's mental health will become less challenged and less of an issue. The problem is, it's like it's like swimming, isn't it, with the baths. If you've never done the, the, the width before, it's bloody scary letting go and doing those first two strokes because you think you're going to sink. And that's where most organisations are, unfortunately. Mm. I think, I think we, we, we reached a point. Um, it wasn't necessarily a conclusion, but in the roundtable discussion, we reached a point where we accepted that... Um, uh, the developing one's personal brand is is not a quick fix you know it's not a case of okay we're focused on the three to five percent of the territory that might be in market let's develop everyone's personal brand so that they look more attractive and stand out and and then all then then everybody that's in market is going to talk to them and and the reality is that's not the case and in order to develop one's personal brand, in order to get to a point where you generate conversations that turn into meaningful relationships, pipeline and revenue, you have to change the entire go to market sales strategy uh, and have one that is focused on the 95 percent of one's territory that isn't in market. And you and you make the effort to build meaningful relationships with those people as human beings. And no one is doing that at the moment, as far as I can see. Well, nobody's doing it because it, it's a, a view uh, that's generated by venture capitalists over in the States that you shouldn't do it. Mm. That you're wasting. So if you if you get, take VC money, they will tell you to focus on the people that, that are currently in the market. You're mm. wasting their money if you're focusing on people outside that market. Mm. And Tim, that's really interesting. So you've obviously got insight into that. I violently agree with it. Um, how's that come about? I mean, how, how, I agree with you. How, have, how have you got that insight into how VC are driving people? Because it's published on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, and you know, there, there are a number of people that on LinkedIn that will, that are saying that you're, you know, why are you wasting your money, um, selling to people that aren't buying? You know, we have a finite amount of money. And you should be focusing on the people that are buying. And, and, and there's a there's a whole narrative, um, especially around the RevOps community, um, that uh, says that. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the fundamental problem is that buyers rarely trust sellers. And that narrative, I'm not interested in talking to you until you have the cash in your pocket, absolutely reinforces that belief, doesn't it? That sellers are after one thing. They're after getting their hand in my pocket and taking out as much money as they can as quickly as they can. And and actually, th this idea about uh, building relationships, about helping people, about uh, developing a brand that stands for more than just punting the product out there, about talking to the 95 rather than the 5% of the market, talking to, well, talking to the 100% rather than the 5% of the market, uh, all of that uh, is absolutely counter to the way that sales has been throughout most of its life isn't it it's about finding people that are ready to buy and taking their money it's about focusing on those people and qualifying them in or out as quickly as you possibly can it's about uh, 
closing at all cost. And yeah. the problem is that 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 further builds a wall, doesn't it, between the salesperson and the vendor. There are many. I mean, I've met hundreds of salespeople that genuinely have the buyer's best interest at heart. They genuinely want to help the buyer. But equally, I've met hundreds of salespeople for whom but, they genuinely want to make their number. But the thing is, is that sales is always short term, isn't it? So, so yeah, the question no, is, what are, you, what are you going to sell this week or this month or this yeah. quarter? Um, and and it's not, you know, you, you know, I won't be in this job um, in in a year's time. So why would I invest in something that's going to bear, bear fruit in twelve months' time? Yeah. So you know, every good question. And, and this is the thing about sales, which is what we want to do is understand what's going to what's going to close this week. Um, I would challenge you, um, Alex, about this myth about personal brands. They don't take a long time. I've got a blog coming out next week or maybe this week. I can't remember. It's in the queue somewhere about about the fact that personal brands don't take a long time. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and, and there's this myth that we have that social selling, personal branding is rubbish. Um, and, um, you know, I saw put someone put something out on LinkedIn about this, you know, and I just had to challenge it. And I even wrote a blog about it saying, you know, this just isn't the case. Yeah. You, know, you have a methodology and you and you have a process. I can imagine if you don't know what to do and you're sitting there and you don't know what to do. Yes, it does take a long time. But yeah. I'm taking professional advice. It doesn't take a long time. Yeah, I, I agree. To time, perhaps it wasn't. Ju it's not just time. It's it's the effort required. It's the transformation that's required. It, everything requires effort, doesn't it? So, you know, <clears throat> does it require you a lot of effort to sit down and think about how you want to present yourself and to, to develop that footprint? Yes, of course it does. Hmm. Does it take a, a, a load of effort to phone 150 people <laughs> and 148 of them don't want to speak to you? And of the two that do, one of them isn't going to buy this year and the other one is just trying to waste your time. Well, that takes a lot of effort. Everything takes effort. And, and I kind of think that, that, um, that, that therein, the fact that these things, to do anything well is not easy, I think therein lies the opportunity for people. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was a piece of cake for everybody to do this stuff, everybody would be doing it, and therefore there would be no competitive advantage for people that do it well. Yeah. The fact that most people, and, you know, Tim and I, since we started the company, and you, Alex, and Andy both know this as well, you know, the, the, what we see is that lots of people can do something today. Lots of people can do something every day this week. Not so many people can do something every day this month. Very few people can do something every day for a year. And yeah. the people that can maintain the right behaviours, whatever those behaviours are, are the people that always win. Always. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it, it, it's, it, you know, in, in sports... You know, um, you look at any of the famous sports people, they will always say, you know, um, it's, it's about maintaining the the, 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 the the push. And if we talk about personal brands, you know, there is now independent research from from Matt Dixon, you know, who we all know and love because of the, the challenger in yeah. his book, The Jolt Effect, that says salespeople need to have a personal brand. So if if you're going to implement the things that Matt Dixon says, as in challenger, you will have to implement a personal brand. Yeah, it's it's non-negotiable now. Yeah, yeah. Well, people don't know how. Well, that's, then they, that's the problem. They need to seek advice of people that do. If it, yeah, which is what we've always done. If we don't know how to run a company, if we don't know how to build a strategy, we you know that's how that's how Accenture and and McKinsey and and Deloitte and PwC make money is because people don't know how to do stuff, so they go out to experts and ask them how to do it. Yeah. Uh, I think so. I, I agree. Uh, I, th I think uh, organisations do need to um, accept that uh, the old way of working, not only is it not working how it once did, but it's affecting the mental health of your sales team, the people that you've hired and, and love in some cases. I don't mean that in a romantic way. Hmm. Um, and as the as the as the workforce as your sales teams get younger this isn't going to get easier so it it, it kind of reminds me of, and i know you've heard me say this before but it, it the situation we're in today it kind of reminds me of you know what happened to the horse and cart in the late 1800s it took for the times to say we have a crisis 
you know, London will be buried under nine feet of horse manure. It's killing people. There are dead horses left on the side of the road. But the rhubarb, mate, the rhubarb <laughs> is fantastic. <laughs> and Henry Ford invented the car to solve that problem, that the, the affordable production car. And, and I guess for sales leaders listening to this, um, uh, that they're not yet aware of this crisis that we're in, uh, you know, just have a think about that. And maybe that's the thing that will encourage them to make a change to the way they're currently selling today. But the, num- the numbers don't say we're in a crisis, though, do they? We, we know we are, because there are certain numbers that say people are walking away from it, uh, from sales, that is, and consequently there are less salespeople. So the sustainability of the number is at risk. That's the one thing that will kick most people at the backside. But the numbers today don't say there's a problem. Because despite we know two-thirds of salespeople don't hit goal, that doesn't mean that they're all way down. There's some people that are around about. Companies are not putting out profit warnings. You, Yeah, okay, so you're talking about growth. But there is a sales problem today. Companies are, are doing all sorts of things to manage expenditure, focus on retention rather than acquisition because acquisition is too hard. They're pulling all of these levers that are available to them, but they're not solving the actual problem. Because they, that's my point, though. They don't, there isn't a problem as far as they're concerned. And most of these people are also either towards the end of their careers and that doesn't really matter to them. Or, as somebody said to me the other day, they're actually taking a quick exit and going and finding out they can be entrepreneurs and consultants and go and live in Cornwall, Dorset, other coastal counties applicable, um, mm-hmm. and, and actually can come in and do some consulting and help those people who are going, I, I need a quick fix on the number. Yeah. The, the issue is actually almost it's, it's down to somebody like Sales TV and, and people who are the academics and whatnot to actually project it out. So wouldn't we actually, for, let's, do what, let's do something wacky. Let's put a <laughs> forecast together and says, actually, here's your problem. This is where the numbers are going to be because you can't keep doing that because the consequence of the consequence is less salespeople, more growth required, to Tim's point. Average targets go up. More people don't hit them. More mental health problems. It's just almost a circle, vicious circle yeah. of thing. And if we don't actually put that together and go, here is the cycle and you're probably somewhere in it are you on rotation number one or two or three but if you get to number five here's the prediction you will have 20 percent less salespeople than you've got now you'll have let's call it five percent more growth aspiration from your investors which means your average target's gone up by 25 30 percent yeah great i think i think that there's there's an issue um there's an issue here, isn't there? The issue is that uh, very few people are interested in the holistic good of everybody. So, yes, you're absolutely right, Andy. But the issue is, actually, we pay, we're one of the highest payers in the country. Therefore, we're never going to have a trouble getting salespeople because we'll just steal them from, I'll steal them from you, Andy, because I'm going to pay more money for them. And actually, many organisations have got that kind of viewpoint. And... And, and add to that is that we're going to make our number because we're going to lay a load of people off. It's one of our biggest costs. Yeah. So, you know, you go out on LinkedIn, you, the number of people that are out of work at the moment is horrendous. Mm. But is that in sales, though? I don't think that's sales. Yeah. Sales. Uh, I mean, in the, last, in the last year, I have spoken to probably an average of two to three new people a week every single week and literally twice the people that i've spoken to have said yeah i've not got a sales uh, a pipeline problem problem is execution for us we have no trouble selling it we are market leaders everybody every other single person literally hundreds of them every other one has said we've got a problem we can't get conversations about sales people can sell that's not in doubt I can't get conversations with people. None of the stuff I'm doing is opening doors. But that's back to the apathy, though, isn't it? That's back to I will hold you out because I don't trust you. Because I know you can... And so that's the customer, to your point there, 
customers know that salespeople can sell, but they don't want to be sold to. And end on a positive note, if possible, chaps. Yes. So, so here we go. I've I'm been... leaving then because I've got a class to go to. So there's a positive. Right. Oh, Cheers, Andy. Andy. Thanks. Yeah. Cheers, Andy. Uh, so I've got five things that I wrote down uh, as five things that businesses can do. Yeah. Have you got five things? I, I can have five things. I'll give you my five things and then yeah. you, can, you can tell me I'm an idiot. Okay. Uh, so the first one is uh, a prospecting culture. Yeah. Everyone, everyone in the organization needs to be on the lookout for conversations. So when I'm talking about prospecting, I'm talking about conversations. I'm talking about having a chat with somebody and seeing where it goes. Uh, so the second thing is being individually visible. So that's personal brand, basically. You know, making sure that uh, that you look like you're attractive to people. You look like you know what you're talking about. You look like you're a decent person. You look like somebody that I would like to spend time with. As the, as the saying goes, if you look more approachable, more people will approach you. So make yourself look approachable. Share some interesting content and do it regularly enough that people don't forget who you are. That's, I think, a really cool idea. Yeah. Um, next thing is try new things. I say new things, but new things for you. Because if you're doing something and it ain't working, what have you got to lose? You know, I'm, I'm doing $100 a day. Nobody wants to talk to me. Okay, well, save the time you're spending doing the $100 a day and do something else. Yeah. I, I'd like it to be social because I believe that's where the future is. But even if it isn't social, even if it's going to coffee shops or going to events or whatever, try something different. Mm. Uh, yeah. Next thing is network. Talk to as many people as you can and see how you can help them and how they can help you. Uh, yeah. And then lastly, humour. You're joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are. You're on fire this morning, Tim. Uh, yeah. No, but have a little bit of humility and, and entertainment and fun and be be somebody that people would like to spend time with. Yeah. Anyway, th those are my five things that you can do. Well, <laughs> what, what, do, what do people think? What does the audience think of that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would, I, I, I'd echo, I'd mirror all five of those. Uh, maybe, maybe dig into network. Uh, oh, here we go from Chris. Oh, it's good, Eric. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Are you good at this, Chris? He is. He is very good, isn't he? And he he's the one that's listening. That's the thing. Uh, um, net, network. I think um, there's, and one of the things that came out of the discussion last week was the digital skill gap. So uh, salespeople just don't know how to build relationships using social media effectively. And so that one, uh, fourth one, Adam, network. It really is about um, uh, looking for people, looking for content, looking for topics on LinkedIn or any other social media network. Um, uh, is, that, is that curiosity, though? Is it? Or I'm that, asking. Yeah, I mean, is that having a sense of curiosity? I think you. I think you've got to. You, you've got to go into it with a, an open mind to explore which which piece of content might be. Uh, most attractive to the audience that I'm targeting, which piece of content, not necessarily my own, but are my target audience uh, commenting on, liking, reading, and engaging in that content so that uh, so that I'm visible. Your first, your second point, Adam, I become more visible to my target audience, but it's that it's that step of actually inserting yourself into the conversation that I think is is one of the most valuable steps that most people most salespeople aren't doing you know dropping the smart question the smart comment but but I, th I think that the the point about uh networking is that it isn't it isn't a platform it's a state of mind yeah you, you go somewhere and you have a chat with somebody and you, you need to be cognizant of the way that human beings interact with each other you know, why would you listen to me tell you what I do if I haven't already listened to you tell me what you do? Mm. You know, this reciprocity, this idea that, you know, we're going to we're going to have a chat 
at this stage, I don't know who you are, what you are, what you do, who you do it for. And I have to, uh, I have to go into the conversation with the expectation that we're going to have a chat and see where it goes. Mm. If you come, if you go in with the expectation that uh, I'm going to sell you something that reinforces the fact that salespeople are just after your money. And actually this is about getting to know someone. And I think, I think, um, Bale's comment here, content marketing is going to be very important driving uh, leads going forward. I think it is, but I think that content marketing is a very dangerous phrase because content marketing is is beautifully polished content that is created by, yeah, created by the marketing department. And I think that's absolutely what isn't needed. I think what is needed is you being yourself, talking about your experience yeah. Your experience at work, your experience of success, your experience of travel, your experience of overcoming challenges, your experience of walking the dog and having dinner and all of those things in the same way you would when you were forging any sort of interpersonal relationship with somebody. Mm. And I think the problem with content marketing as a phrase is that for many people, this is a 10,000 word white paper explaining why we're really good at something. And what we all know is that if you double the length of the paragraph you're about to write, half as many people will read it. Mm. Actually, this is about saying, here are 10 things I'm going to tell you. So that's 10 posts, not a post containing 10 things. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 absolutely. We, no. we know that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's the point. You know, th this is about absolutely about you creating your own content, your own spin on something, because I don't need to know that to pick a company at random. I don't need to know that IBM have a solution for this because IBM is 300,000 people and I only know four of them. I want to know that you at IBM are the person that can guide me through this because then you're my entry point into that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. To, to Dale's point there, um, impact of marketing uh, was the topic that came up in the discussion last week. But traditional marketing strategies are losing effectiveness month over month. And, it's and, 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 that's, and that's ironically, I suspect probably the quality of content that marketing departments are producing is getting higher, but the engagement is going down because it's not about how good it is. You only know how good something is when you've read it. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to read it because you haven't got time or because you don't know who the hell the person is that's sharing it. Yeah. I must admit, so uh, I think you saw this, Chris Gill. A friend, a mutual friend of ours. Uh, uh, I thought it was lovely to see him post about himself walking on the beach yesterday. He was still talking about a piece of marketing content, some insight mm. that the business he worked for had created. But it was so human and genuine the fact that he was just strolling along the beach, bit of a bit of a bit, of, you know, bit of a cloudy day in the background. Um, but you know, I listened to it and yeah. That's the point. If it's... Ah, but I think the, the reason that you listen to it is because you love him. He's a great guy. <laughs> and, and that's the point. He's already built that equity with you. It, it, uh, I saw the post, Alex, and I didn't listen to it because the, the stop, there was something really dull and boring at the top, which was product related. And, and, and I went, no. Ah, okay, good point. And, and, and I think that that's the thing, that the, the better you know somebody and the more you like somebody, the more you are prepared to tolerate that strap line. And it was something about the, the sales enablement is amazing. Oh, yeah, you're trying to sell me something. Yeah. yeah. If he just said, if the headline had been uh, a cloud, cloudy day, but I need my breath of fresh air anyway, then you would have watched it. And you would if have it was something about him and, and, uh, yeah. and then he would... Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have watched it, but it was like, and he used the hashtag in sell, as sales and everyone. It's like you know, this is a sales page. Yeah, and and I think that that's the point, isn't it? You know, he's a lovely guy. I really like him. He's incredibly polished and engaging and personable. And when you see that, if if there was no sale attached to that, you consume that because you go, yeah, he looks like a really cool guy. I'll listen to what he has to say. And you would have consumed it by accident. When you know him, you go, well, I'll watch it anyway, because actually he's really good at delivering stuff. So there might be something of value in there. Yeah. But, but so much of this is about not just farming the people that already know you, but farming out beyond that, using those people to leapfrog out to a larger audience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there was, I tried to, uh, 
I tried to leverage uh, generative AI to help me prepare a summary from the transcript of an right. hour long discussion. And it, it was interesting, some of the things that, that came out. Uh, do you want me to share them with you? Yeah, please. The conversation suggests that the future of sales will likely focus on personal branding, long term relationships, and digital skills rather than just immediate sales performance metrics. It's got to be right if it's come from uh, um, ChatGPT. Yeah. And uh, um, that's, that's a joke, by the way. <laughs> I, 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 I was, was going to say uh, for, for Chris's comment do a comedy workshop of some kind. Uh, humor is one of the best tools, uh, you know, for, for adversity. Oh, no, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the sales panto. Uh, <sighs> yeah. Did, did we get all five of the... Because um, we got five minutes, four minutes to go. Can you rattle through what the five things were are then, Alex? There's way more than five. Oh. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, keeping to keeping to deadlines and, and doing what you're told is that one shift, shift in focus relationship building changing buyer behavior virtual communications Salespeople mm -hmm. don't you know that they're, they're craving the in-person and the in-person isn't what it was even though we've said that they don't do enough in person and and, and they do all the okay uh digital skill gap we spoke about impact of marketing uh this, this idea of growth marketing, and Brent Adamson's talked about this, 2010, 2020, that 10 years was the era of, you know, growth marketing. I think that's, I think that's gone now as we, as we talked about buyers are switching off, zoning out to the sales and marketing message. Um, generational shifts that we've spoken about, social media being such a symbiotic thing for Gen Z. You know, I had a conversation separately with a Gen Z that said, well, social media for Gen Zs is very private. You're never going to get them to use that in a professional sense. I said, well, if they're natural at it, from a personal perspective, building friendships, then they, they're likely to be good at it in a professional sense. Um, anyway, that's, a, that's probably an hour-long discussion on its own. <laughs> Uh, we spoke about reward systems and we're measuring the wrong things. We should be measuring things like relationship building, uh, complexity of bidding and how flexible organizations are having to get when it comes to pricing. Yeah. Uh, qualification and coaching through AI. That was, that was an interesting topic. Okay. Given how much knowledge there is around, uh, uh, on the internet, sales organizational structure. The one thing that we didn't get into that uh, we, we ran out of time was the role of the SDR. And, and I know we've talked about this a lot, but in light of the discussion that we've been having this morning, the need for the SDR to be uh, more human, more authentic and focusing on building relationships and working in partnership with the sales team to, to, the, to your point, I know you've raised before, to manage those peaks and troughs with relationship building, lead generation, uh, and, the, and the future of sales needing uh, the SDR to adapt significantly. Yeah. And then there was a final statement, again, from AI uh, that's ironic. Overall, it seems like AI and technology have the potential to significantly improve sales processes by enabling more relevant conversations, better coaching, and more effective qualification of leads. Um, the AI isn't always right, but I think there's some truth in that. That's a really good point, <clears throat> Jan's point there. I think the part, part of the challenge that, that we have, and you know, we spoke about content marketing briefly, you know, as, as uh, Eric Schmidt said back in you know, 2005, whatever it was, there's more content created now in any 48 hour, hour window than there was from the beginning of recorded history through to 2003. So content we have, what we need is context. And why am I going to read the post that you've just done, Alex? Because you did it. Mm -hmm. That's the point, isn't it? And that's why personal brand is so pivotal to people's success moving forward. 
if I don't know who you are and like you, I'm not going to invest any of my time in it. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, we're, we're at time. So uh, thank you to everybody in the audience for joining us this morning. Some, thank you. Thank you so much. Really outstanding time. comments, as there always is. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you later today. If not, we'll see you next week. Uh, have a lovely day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, all.